Today my dad finally allowed me to start using Reddit. He's been very nervous about this. He even wrote me a list of subreddits not to look at. Of course, that makes me really curious, but I always do what daddy says, so there's no way I'm actually going to check any of them out. So, hello everyone. How are you? My name is Maggie, and I live in a huge house with my dad, and a lot of other people he says need to be under close observation and close to medical treatment at all times. When I asked him what that meant, he told me that we all need to be watched by doctors and nurses here so in case something happens to us, they can take care of it. Apparently, we're all sick in one way or another. Personally, I feel fine so I'm not sure why I'm here at all. I've been asking dad but he never gives me an actual answer. He just kind of talks around the subject whenever I bring it up. Another weird thing is that none of the other patients have their parents with them. I think they're all older than me though, so I guess it's not that strange. Dad is around me literally all the time. Well, not all the time, but quite often. When he's not with me, he talks to the nurses and doctors, or he goes into his office. He works here too. Once a day, I have to talk to a doctor myself. Her name is Ellie and she's very nice to me, but not to Dad. She never lets him stay when she talks to me. Apart from that, I like our daily appointments though. Her room is very nice. There's a lot of photos of ducks on the walls and she even has a stuffed duck on her desk. She lets me hold it every time that I talk to her. And ducks are her favorite animal. Dr. Ellie never really examines me, she just asks me questions. Today, for example, after she told Dad to wait for me outside and had me sit down across from her, she asked how I was feeling. That's always her first question. I said that I was well and asked to hold the duck. She gave it to me and then asked how my day had been so far, what I had had for breakfast, that sort of thing. It was just small talk. Then she asked me if I had had that dream again. You see, I have these nightmares sometimes. They're really fuzzy and unclear, but basically... I dream of men in weird dark clothes. They always have these masks on that cover their faces and leave out only the mouth and eyes. Sometimes I dream that they're holding me down and that one of them keeps shouting stuff at me while I'm crying. Not last night, I said to her. That makes you nightmare free 20 nights in a row, she replied. She was smiling but she didn't sound too happy. I'm sure you don't miss them. They scare me for a little while, but all in all, they're just dreams. That's what daddy says. Dr. Ellie frowned. That's what your daddy says, huh? She repeated. Right. I know I ask you this a lot as well, but has your dad ever done anything to hurt you? I shook my head no. Never, or maybe not hurt you. But did he tell you odd things? Or did he do anything to make you feel strange in any way? I shook my head no again. Dr. Ellie didn't look satisfied. Well, that's good. Why would my daddy ever do something like that? I asked. And never mind. I thought I would ask. A lot of kids have very mean parents after all. She replied. That's sad, but my dad isn't like that. That's great, Maggie. That's all that I wanted to hear. You don't like my dad, do you? Dr. Ellie tensed up a bit. That's not true. Your dad and I have a history, though. We go way back, so to speak. And there's a lot I can't tell you because it's well. Between him and me and our colleagues, you know. I told her that I didn't get that at all, but she didn't want to tell me anything else. Our time was up after that anyway, so I got back out where Dad was waiting for me. I saw him and Ellie glare at each other for a split second through the open door. But the really weird thing happened afterwards. I wanted to take a nap, so Dad came with me to tuck me in. He stayed by my bedside until I was already half asleep before turning to leave. I heard him shut the door behind him, and just one second later, he gasped. I sat up immediately, startled. 
What are you doing here? I heard him hiss at whoever was outside with them. I could ask you the same thing. I thought you had agreed on giving her space. The voice was Dr. Ellie's. She didn't sound like she does when she talks to me, though. She sounded angry. Jack, what exactly do you think you're doing? Can we please take this somewhere else? Dad replied in a hushed tone. What? Are you afraid that you'll hear us? Well, of course I am. Move along now, we're going to your office. Are we? Because I'm staying right here. Dad sighed deeply. I don't have time for this. Why would I want to deal with your crap in the first place? Well, then maybe I should talk to her myself. This has been going on for long enough anyways. The heck you will, because I... I heard my door being locked. I have the only key to her room as of now. She's asleep in there, so if you try and talk to her from out here like an idiot, I'd tell her that it was all a dream. Meanwhile, I'll be off and get security, and when I come back, you'll be rid of your job, I promise you that. Dad sounded really casual when he said this, but with that kind of concealed rage, people carry in their tone sometimes. Dr. Ellie didn't say anything for a little while. When she spoke up again, she sounded almost sad. This is sick. You are so sick, Jack. No, you think. Well, I don't really care, to be honest. And before you ask, nobody else does. In fact, do you really think our bosses gave her to you? You who graduated rock bottom of your class. The most inexperienced shrink of everyone they've got. Because they want her to get better. Noticing that he had raised his voice, Dad suddenly fell silent. I could hear him press up against the door. Maggie? He asked softly. I didn't respond. I gave him no sign that I was awake at all. Something about what I had just heard made me feel like I shouldn't. And Dad let out a sigh of relief. I'm gonna go get lunch now. He said to Dr. Ellie quieter this time. You should think about what I said though. Really, think about it. I heard him walk off, followed by the clacking of Dr. Ellie's heels on the floor. Not sticking around after all. Good choice. Dad said just before they were too far away for me to hear them anymore. I tried to sleep a little bit, but I kept thinking about the two of them. None of what they had been talking about made any sense to me. Eventually, Dad came back to get me. I was really happy when he did because I had been getting bored. He took me out of the hall where everybody eats and told me to get something for myself on my own since he had to get back to work. I wasn't happy about it, but I saw Jonah sitting at a table in the back. So once Dad was off, I went to sit with him. Jonah's my friend. I love talking to him, but I only do it when my dad isn't around. My father really hates him for some reason. Once, the two of them actually got into a fight. Like a real fist fight. A couple of the nurses had to break it off. Jonah's about dad's age. He's taller though and very strong, but not scary. He lost his right leg, although he won't tell me how. And the people here have been building a new one for him. They're still working on it and he needs to get used to it first, so he can't go anywhere without crutches. That's also why I was so scared when Dad had attacked him that one time. Since Jonah was trying to hit him back, I thought he was going to trip and fall over, but he could actually stand for a whole minute without his crutches. Them fighting was terrible, but I overheard one of the nurses later saying that at least now they knew Jonah was adapting to the mechanical leg. I've asked him thousands of times why he doesn't get along with dad, but he always dodges the question. I like him anyways. He has this really nice smile and when we talk, he doesn't treat me like I'm a dumb kid. More like we're old friends. Nay, Mags, he said when I sat down across from him. He was holding a large slice of pizza. There was a carton with more sitting in front of him and he nodded down at it. You want some? I thanked him and took a slice of my own. How are you? I'm alright, it's a pizza day. 
Doesn't get much better than this now, does it? Not around here, at least. He hummed as he ripped a large bite from the slice in his hand. And do they make the pizza here? Jonah laughed. Heck no, they don't. If they did, it would be just as crappy as the rest of their food. But that's hospitals for you. Wait, so this is a hospital? I never thought of it as one. No, sorta. Sorry. I just forgot I'm not supposed to talk to you about that. He rolled his eyes at an imaginary bystander. What do you mean by that? Nothing, just something that's been going for way too long. One of these days, I might just forget altogether. Forget what? And to keep my mouth shut. This freaked me out a little, but he didn't say anything else, so I stopped prodding. We ate in relatively comfortable silence, but Jonah ate faster than me, and about twice as much. When there was nothing left, he wiped his mouth and smiled at me. Come over here, I've got something to show you. I quickly ducked under the table and emerged on Jonah's side where I sat down. He lifted his prosthetic leg up on the bench beside us and pulled up the bottom of his sweatpants. I almost jumped in my seat. Jonah's mechanical leg is black and made of some kind of shiny metal, or at least I think so. But what he showed me looked completely different. There was skin all over it and it appeared rather soft. Oh my god, I muttered. It's amazing, right? I can't even feel anything off about this anymore. I can move it perfectly. It looks exactly like it used to. Well, I used to have hair on it, but that's fine. That's so great, congrats. I know they finally finished it. I know we were off to a rocky start in it first, well, you saw me and you know that I was struggling. But now this is worth the wait. I still keep my crutches at hand because I don't want to test my luck just yet. But I'm really positive about this. My dog says that he wants me relaxing and getting used to it for six more months, and then I can start working out again. I can't wait. Wait, what do you work as? Oh, I did the same thing as you. What? I looked at him, my eyes wide with confusion. I've never had a job. Jonah sighed. Yeah, right. How could I forget? You're kind of being weird, I admitted. Am I? Sorry, I don't even notice anymore. Not long after, I saw my dad enter the hall. I was still sitting with Jonah, so I immediately started freaking out and wanted to hide under the table. But my friend grabbed my arm gently but firmly to keep me seated. My father proceeded towards us with a deep frown on his face. He didn't even acknowledge Jonah's presence when he came to a halt in front of us. Maggie, princess, did you eat? His voice was strained, even though he was trying to hide it. I nodded and dad raised his brows. Good, I'm sorry I was gone for so long. I'll be off again soon too, but I got the computer room wide open for you so that you can play in there. Thanks, dad. I scrambled down from the bench, walked over to him and took his hand. Before we left, he addressed Jonah. I was stunned to be honest. How are you adjusting? Even Jonah himself seemed puzzled. Can't complain. You did a good job on this one, man. My father ignored the compliment. I was a little surprised. I didn't know Dad was one of the people who had created Jonah's leg. I had known that he had worked here, sure, but until now, I had never thought about what he exactly did. We turned to leave and Dad walked me to the computer room. This room, as the name implies, is filled with computers. The patients may use it from time to time, but they have to share it with the research assistants. Dad says that's because they need to work but aren't important enough to have their own office. That's when Dad explained Reddit to me and gave me the list of subreddits that I can't look at and everything. This site is really cool. It feels like there's everything the internet has to offer here. That aside, I actually got curious, so I did some research on prosthetics such as Jonah has. It seems like they're actually not very common outside of this place. That really makes me wonder a bit. 
Just another odd thing about this hospital, I guess. But the strangest thing, the reason why I'm writing this, happened afterwards. I didn't feel like surfing the web anymore, so I went to my room to change clothes so I could go take a walk outside in the yard. I opened the door to find something lying on the floor. It was a photo. Surprised, I bent down to pick it up. My stomach turned when I laid eyes on the picture and felt bile rise in my throat. It was a monster. It sounds childish and very rude saying that since I know very well that must have been a person at some point, but it didn't look like one anymore. They were lying in a hospital bed, not unlike those that I had seen in some of the rooms here in the building, but the sheets were soaked with blood and some other yellowish fluid. Their lower half was covered by a blanket. From what I could see, there was hardly any skin left on their body. Instead, it hung shredded off their limbs and torso. It reminded me of what it looks like when deers shed the skin on their antlers. The lower part of one of the person's arms was missing, leaving behind only a stump from which a broken bone protruded. The person's scalp was torn up badly and chunks of hair were hanging down from bits and pieces of it. The worst thing, however, were the eyes. Don't get me wrong, the eyes were the only thing about them that were left unharmed, but they were wide open and looking right at me. The person had looked into the camera when the picture had been taken. This mangled mess of a body. It wasn't a corpse. At the time of the photo, they had to have been alive. I doubled over and threw up on the floor. The picture slid out of my hand. I sat there for minutes, retching and weeping. The door was still open a crack, so it was no surprise when one of the male nurses, I think his name was Ethan, who had been passing by noticed me and came in. He found me kneeling there beside that awful picture, grabbing me by the arm and pulling me to my feet. He half dragged, half carried me into the mess hall, where he sat me down on a bench. He tried to talk to me, but I couldn't hear what he said. I could hear his lips moving, but it sounded like his voice was nothing but the faint sound of static somewhere far off in the distance. I was panting and crying. I remember thinking it was really hard to breathe. It sounds silly now, but I suppose I thought I was going to die, and that's how terrified I was. Two other nurses came up to us. One of them was Cassandra, another friend of mine. She pushed through to me and quickly made me swallow a tiny pill. She then gently grabbed my ankles and lifted my legs up onto the bench, turning me around in the process. And when she spoke, her voice was clearer than Ethan's. She was very calm and just the sound of her speaking, softly telling me to breathe more slowly, was enough to soothe my nerves a little. Meanwhile, Ethan and the other lady had jarred off in different directions. One was heading for the hallway that my room was in and the other to where the doctors have all their offices, presumably to find dad. I fell asleep before they came back. When I woke up, I was in my room again lying in bed. It's very late at night now as of me writing this, but after having slept so much already, I guess it's no surprise that I'm kind of restless. One of the nurses must have removed the picture because I can't find it anywhere. I sneaked out to the computer room again because I really didn't feel like staying where I was. So, that's where I'm at now. I'm so confused. I've never questioned this place before, but now, I feel like something really bad is going on here. I feel like Ellie and Jonah both wanted to tell me that the picture has something to do with it. And worse yet, I'm pretty sure Dad knows. Hey, it's Maggie again. You guys were really nice to me last time, but I'm doing a lot worse than yesterday. Something happened and I don't know how to say this, but I guess I'll just start at the beginning. First off though, some of you asked me a few things that I want to answer really quick. I want to talk about them anyway, so it's good you brought those up. Yes, there are mirrors here, but only in the bathrooms. My room doesn't have one, so I have to use the one accessible to everyone from the hallway. Dad says and never to look at my reflection too long though. He says that girls worry too much about their looks and that I shouldn't be like that and I always do what dad tells me. 
As for my age, I don't want to say how old I am exactly because it's the internet and it scares me. Also, I've always been living here at the hospital. I don't know if we've ever lived anywhere else, but I can't remember. I also don't know anything about my mother and I've never wondered about her. Dad's here for me. I'm not missing anything. So anyways, I had to talk to Dr. Ellie for two entire hours this morning. She was being really nice about the whole picture thing, but I kind of hated telling her about it. It made me think of that person again, and I just wanted to forget about them. At the end of our session, Dr. Ellie asked me something very strange, though. Have you ever heard of something called Operation Magpie? I frowned. Something about these two words resonated with me, but I had no idea what they meant. It sounds familiar, but I don't know what it is. Alright, well, I just thought, maybe. She sighed and buried her face in her hands for a split second. What is Operation Magpie, then? Please, forget that I ever said anything, she muttered. And with that, she sent me off. Dad wasn't outside the office where he had dropped me off. I felt incredibly lonely after last night, so I went to look for the next best person to keep me company that I could think of. Jonah was in his room, sitting on his bed and staring up at the TV. His room is very much like mine. The same bed, a closet, small table, and television. I came in without knocking. A bad habit of mine, but he didn't tell me off for it. Even though he usually does. Hey, Maggie, he said quietly. A buddy of mine told me what happened. How are you? Uh, better, I said, climbing up to sit next to him on top of his pillow. I'm sorry that I didn't come to see you. I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk to anybody. I do, just not about the picture. Oh, all right then. He fell silent and we watched TV for a little while. There was a rugby match on and didn't really care for it. Jonah, what's Operation Magpie mean? My friend flinched. He flinched so hard that he dropped the remote onto the floor beside the bed. You remember Operation Magpie, he stammered. In his eyes, a mix of joy and disbelief that I couldn't place. No, but Dr. Ali had mentioned it earlier. Jonah deflated. Oh, well, um, I'm not supposed to say. He sounded disappointed. Why not? Who's keeping you? That would be your dad. What? Jonah shrugged. This is not easy to explain. I could try to talk around it, but okay. Let's say Operation Magpie had to do with my job, and by extension your dad's. But that's all I can tell you. You're not making any sense at all. I'm sorry, but how am I supposed to say this? I want to tell you I do, but I can't. Jonah's voice was low and empty. I still had no idea what he was saying, but there was a feeling of dread rising within me that I simply couldn't shake. Mags, your father is a genius. My leg is his doing, and he's made so much more like it. So much more complicated stuff. You should know that this kind of technology, the way that we can replace parts of the body here, Hardly anybody outside these walls has access to that sort of thing. And we have your dad to thank for it. I mean, not only him, of course. There's the other doctors and nurses, and they're all doing amazing work here, but the prosthetics, they're mostly Jack's thing. My jaw must have dropped. Jonah went on. He drafts them. He oversees their development. He does a lot of the engineering that goes into it and he made it possible to cover them up with a realistic-looking skin. He's the most intelligent man that I've ever met. And then why do you hate him? Oh, because he's also the craziest. He's messed up in the head. And why does he hate you? Jonah sighed. Look, Jack and I have something of an ongoing feud. He's done something that I don't agree with, something really bad. There's hardly anyone who confronts him about it, but I do. He knows that he's wrong, but he keeps trying to justify it. I give him the truth, but he doesn't want to hear it, and that's why. Yeah, but what did he do? I said I can't tell you, okay? Jonah groaned, wiping his forehead. 
I'm sorry. You're gonna have to leave me alone about this. I hated giving in like that, but I didn't want to argue with him either. I stayed in my friend's room for another hour, trying to make small talk and watching the game with him. Eventually, I fell asleep and Jonah had to poke me in the arm until I woke up again. You should go to your room if you want to sleep, he told me. It's bad enough you come in here without knocking. I'm not going to let you take over my entire room. I told him that I was sorry and he just laughed and said that I was acting a little bit like a cat. I made my way out into the hallway and back to my room. I wasn't sleepy anymore though for some reason. I hadn't seen dad all day and I couldn't stop wondering why he hadn't showed up to look after me at least once. I was starting to get a little worried. After further futile attempts to try and occupy myself, I gave up and got on my way to start looking for dad in his office. Walking down the corridor, I noticed that it was oddly quiet that day. That was why I jumped when I heard a door slam and the loud clacking of heels approaching. I saw Dr. Ellie walk towards me from the very back of the hallway, where Dad's office was located. As she came closer, I realized that she was sobbing quietly. Her shoulders were trembling and she was wiping her eyes. I stopped in my tracks. What's wrong? I asked her. Maggie. She sounded like she hadn't noticed me standing there until I had spoken up. What were you going to my dad for? I, we had a pretty big fight, your dad and I. You won't be seeing me around here anymore. Why not? Did daddy make you cry? She sniffled, stifling a chuckle. A little bit. What did you fight about? I took a step towards her and searched my pockets for a handkerchief for her, but I couldn't find anything. I don't get it. Everybody's got some kind of problem with dad. Your dad does a lot of stuff that makes a lot of people very upset. Me too. I've tried to talk some sense into him, but well. He's finally made good on his threat. He always told me that he'll have my job if I don't stop pestering him, and now... Now he's actually having me fired. No way I'm telling anybody about my nightmares but you. I'm gonna talk to him. Oh, that's sweet, but I doubt it'll help. I shrugged. I'm just going to try, okay? No harm in trying. I went past her and into Dad's office. I came in without knocking again. He was sitting at his desk and at first, he didn't seem to notice me at all. He was staring at something that was lying in front of him. I couldn't see it since it was obscured behind all the other stuff cluttering the workspace. But he was moving one of his arms over the thing, almost like he was petting a kitten. His eyes were so fixated on the object that it felt like he wasn't present at all. His mind was miles away. It almost looked a bit creepy. What do you have there? I asked. Dad flinched as his head jerked up and he let out a tiny gasp. In a matter of seconds, he had torn open the upper drawer of his desk and dropped whatever he had been stroking inside. He slammed it shut. I was confused. Why was he in such a hurry to hide this thing from me? Nothing, he said. You really need to learn to knock at a door before coming in. It's rude and you know one day you might see something that you don't like. Like what? He threw his head back inside. You're killing me, so what is it? You didn't come to see me at all today. Were you busy? Yeah, sorry. You didn't get lonely, did you? He waved me over to him and patted his leg. I'm a little big for his sitting on his lap, but he says that's okay. He says he dreads the day that I outgrow him. So I sat down and hugged him and he asked how I was feeling and all that. We talked, but I was staring at the drawer the whole time. Dad noticed. We should go. Let's grab a snack or something. Just as we were getting up, one of the nurses came rushing in. He looked panicked and seemed to be in a hurry. Jack, you've got to come over to the B station. There's been an emergency and we need an extra hand. The B station is another wing of the hospital, one where I'm not allowed to go on my own. Dad immediately followed the nurse out the door, dragging me along with him and apologizing over and over for having to leave me to myself again. 
He dropped me off in the mess hall and told me to get something to eat myself. All I could think of though was that he hadn't locked his office door on the way out. Once he was out of sight, I turned around and walked all the way back into the section with the researchers' workplaces. I was all alone in the hallway, but knowing that I wasn't supposed to be there still made me feel watched somehow. I quietly pressed down the handle of my father's office door and slipped inside. Without dad in it, the room was kind of oppressive. The wall seemed high yet way too close at the same time. I sneaked over to the desk and opened the top drawer. When I laid my eyes on what was inside, my heart sank. It was a bone. It was smooth and white and almost slender in its shape. One end broken off and splintered. I slammed the drawer shut and stormed outside, closing the door behind me and colliding full force with the somebody right behind me. I whimpered and spun around to find myself face to face with Jonah. His jaw dropped when he saw the look on my face and he immediately rested his hand on my shoulder, awkwardly trying to comfort me. What's wrong? He asked softly. What happened? I took deep breaths, but they came too fast. It was hard, squeezing words out in between. There's a bone in Dad's office. It can't be from any kind of food. It's too big and too clean. Jonah's face fell, but he said nothing. Why is it in there? I panted. Jonah, what's going on? How did you find it? I saw him, like, play with it earlier, but when I came in, he put it away. Okay, calm down. We should leave here. He reached for my hand, and I let him pull me along back into the section of the station intended for us patients. I don't really want to be seen running around back there. Jack's always looking for an excuse to give it to me. I don't want to serve it to him myself. I just saw you walk back there and thought that I should check on you. My breathing slowed and I nodded at him. Thanks. Hey, you don't have your crutches anymore. I remarked, but he ignored it. Look, there's something that I need to talk to you about. I can't really keep it in any longer and I don't want to, so... I can't just bust out a whole story here, but I'm not the only one who tried to give your memory a little shove in the right direction. My memory? I was puzzled. Jonah groaned. Never mind. But there's one thing I want you to think about. You've seen my leg, yes. Notice how I didn't have a single hair there. I nodded wordlessly. Apart from your eyebrows and lashes and that on your head, do you have hair anywhere on your body? Rude, I said. Jonah let out a forced laugh. You don't get it, do you? He grabbed me by the arm and without even giving me the chance to protest, he dragged me down the hallway and into one of the bathrooms. It was the ladies' room, but there was no one else around who saw us, so it didn't matter. Inside, Jonah ushered me over to one of the sinks. Give me your hand, he ordered. I hesitantly reached out and let him position my arm over the edge of the sink. And then he pulled something small and shiny out of his pocket. It was one of those tiny knives a surgeon's cut you up with. My stomach sank and I immediately tried to turn around and make for the door. But Jonah's other hand had wrapped around my wrist and before I knew it, he pulled me back. I opened my mouth to scream, but Jonah shushed me. Quiet, this isn't going to hurt, I promise. I really need to show you something. I was trembling and dirty, feeling tears in my eyes, but I obeyed. I didn't want to risk him taking that scalpel to my throat. Jonah slowly brought the tip of the tiny blade down on my lower arm. He had been wrong, it did hurt. But oddly enough, not nearly as much as I had expected it would. It was almost unnoticeable. Still, I squirmed in his grip and whimpered like a crying puppy, but it was more due to fear than actual pain. I turned to look away, I couldn't bear to watch. Finally, he sat the knife aside and I risked a quick glance. There was no blood on it. Frowning in confusion, I looked down at my injured arm. Jonah had cut out an unfinished square. I could see the three lines the scalpel had left, but without the anticipated red drops protruding from them. 
Jonah carefully shoved the tip of his finger underneath my skin. I gagged when I watched him lift it up, press his thumb against it on the other side, and then cautiously peel it back. I thought that I had been horrified when I had seen the picture of that mangled body in my room. But when I laid eyes on what was underneath my skin, a new kind of shock took a hold of me. The inside of my arm wasn't red, veiny and meaty as I had always thought. It was black, smeared with some sort of slimy, transparent glue, but still shiny, almost exactly like Jonah's leg before it had gotten its coating. I had never questioned the workings of my body. This was me, this was my shell. These were the legs that carried me and the arms I used to carry food to my mouth. I had always felt like myself, unrestricted by any bodily ailments, free to move however I wanted. How would I have known there was metal inside me, or plastic, or whatever this was? I think I fainted because I can't remember anything after that sight. I woke up in my bedroom though. Jonah had probably brought me back. My head was reeling and I only got up to grab my trash can because I needed to hurl a little. When I was starting to feel better, I sneaked off into the computer room and that's where I am now. I don't know what to make of this yet. Dad has to have known about my arm, but I keep wondering if my arm's where it stops. What if I'm all plastic underneath this? What Jonah said really made me think. I actually don't have hair like anywhere. I searched the web and as it turns out, kids my age normally have body hair. Even if it's still really thin and almost invisible. I don't have any of that. Nowhere. It's just smooth, hairless skin. What scares me even more is that I searched my face for it as well and apart from my brows and eyelashes, there was absolutely nothing. But that's not even all. Something else doesn't add up here. Dr. Ellie found me in the computer room a little while ago. Our exchange was short, but it weirded me out nonetheless. There you are, I've been looking for you. Is everything all right? I didn't want to tell her about my arm at first, but she knew already, seeing as she went on with. Jonah and I talked. I know what he showed you. I have to be frank with you, I've known for a long time. She took a few steps towards me and then leaned in close to speak into my ear. Don't tell your daddy what you found out just yet, okay? I felt her slide as something cold and smooth into my hand. This is the key to my office. They won't clean it out until tomorrow night, but I won't ever be in it again. So tomorrow it's all yours. There's a lot for you to see in there. Be careful though. Jonah will help you if he can. You can trust him. Where are you going? I asked quietly. Dr. Ellie drew back. I'm going to look for somewhere else to work, I guess. But I can still try and talk to my dad. I'll get him too. Sweetie, it's okay. I'll be fine. Now, you're about to find out some stuff if you go in there tomorrow and you may not like it. But please, don't resist. Just let it come back to you. She gave me a sad smile. I'm sorry for what you're about to see and I'm sorry for the role that I played in it. I hope you'll forgive me. I hugged her. I'm not supposed to hug her, but I didn't care. Now that she was leaving, it wouldn't matter anyways. I don't know what she is waiting in her room for me or what her conspiring with Jonah means, but I'll find out. Tomorrow, I'm going in. I shut and locked the office door behind me when I went in, and then I drew the blinds of the only window from which you can look out into the hallway. I didn't want anyone to find me there. I grabbed the duck first because I felt like I would need moral support for this. With the plushie tucked under my arm, I grabbed the top folder and sat down with it under Dr. Ellie's desk. There were a few sheets of paper in there stapled together. Weirdly enough, it was all handwritten, and it started kind of like a letter. Hi, Ellie. So you asked me about Operation Magpie. I'll be real with you, I didn't want to tell you anything at first. You probably got some information from whoever your exact superiors are already, but I'm guessing you're wondering what Jack has to do with this and how it all went down. 
since you're going to be taking care of Maggie, I guess I have to fill you in. I really want her to be okay. She needs to be in good hands. The thing about Jack and the details of the magpie operation aren't secret or classified or anything, but it's important that Maggie does not find out. You're new here, so you might not know, but in the beginning, there were four people working on Maggie's case. The original idea was to bring her memory back ASAP, but every time they tried to confront her with what happened, she would suffer extreme panic attacks. I even saw her one time. I swear it looked like she was suffocating. She probably was. I've never had an episode like that, so I wouldn't know what it feels like, but it wasn't too much of a surprise when they said that. They didn't want to risk her having another one, especially since after every episode, it was like she would slip further away. So, to tell you how Jack fits into this whole mess, I have to start at the beginning. I hope this isn't going to take too long because honestly, I just hate thinking about it. The name Eva might ring a bell with you. Eva used to work in security with me. I used to chat with her a lot and we became friends. We used to hang out all the time when we were on break and we even met up outside our work since we both loved rugby and watched the matches together. That's how I found out about Jack too. You see, Jack and I barely knew each other before this and I would have been happy if it had stayed that way. But one day Eva told me that she brought the doctor whose lab she had been watching on her shift earlier had a bit of a thing for her. I was like, oh really? And she said, yeah, he kept coming outside to talk to me. She seemed more amused about this than anything else. I asked her what she thought about the guy. A bit unprofessional if you ask me. I mean, he had work in there. I laughed. So you're not into him. Eva kind of pulled a face like she hadn't wanted to talk about that part. He was being really nice to me and I don't want to sound like a cow, but he works here, you know. A workplace is a delicate thing like that. Plus, I heard him yell at his lab assistant and that was really creepy. And that's how Eva met Jack. I suppose she thought nothing else would come of it, but it didn't stop there. The next time she had had her shift patrolling the floor with his office on it, I asked her how it went with him, or if she had seen him at all. She actually seemed a little uncomfortable. She would told me that he had followed her on her way through her routine and kept talking to her, even when she had told him that she thought he should return to his work. It just got worse from there. I'm telling you, he was obsessed with her. One time, Eva told me in confidence that she was pretty sure she had seen him taking photos of her with his phone. I tried to look into our security footage to get proof of that, but as you might know, only very few areas of this building have camera equipment, so of course I came up with nothing. And then Eva's lipstick went missing. She never wore makeup at work except for that lipstick. It was this really subtle color and she loved it. She would use it every day and she was so upset when she lost it. I told her that she should just buy a new one, but she said that she hasn't been able to find one like it. It wouldn't have been a big deal if it weren't for me stumbling upon Jack in the men's room one day. I had just opened the door a little and I could see him leaning against the wall in there playing with something. I swear that it was Eva's lipstick. I would have recognized that old thing anywhere. He hadn't noticed me so I stayed there and watched as he kept sniffing it. And then he licked it. I pushed the door open and he jumped. I was kind of embarrassed so I tried to pretend that I hadn't seen anything. I just looked over at him and said, Oh hey, you found my friend's lipstick. He shuddered immediately probably thinking that I hadn't seen him mess around with it. And laughed really awkwardly. Yeah, it was lying around on the floor here. No clue how it got in here. <laughs> Bullcrap. He seemed to think for a few seconds before handing it to me. Uh, can you give it back to her? I did return it, but I also told Eva to throw it away. Of course, I explained why and asked if she wanted to file a complaint or something, but she said no. She thought it was too much trouble and wouldn't lead to anything, and in the end... She would be the one to looking like a weirdo. They're just going to think that I'm paranoid, she said. 
There would be incidents like that on a regular basis. She also told me that he had been getting kind of handsy during their one-sided conversations. Unwanted hugs, accidentally touching her waist or the small of her back, stuff like that. I said the complaint was overdue by now, but she was still reluctant. She always said he never contacted her outside of work and that he also never became too obvious about whatever weird crap he was pulling. It was almost like he was afraid of her. I don't know if all of this makes sense. I was planning on changing her mind still, but then, Operation Magpie happened. I'm sure you know about Magpie, so I don't want to go into too much detail there. But just so you understand the gist of it, here it is. Since our thing here is drugs and prosthetics and experimental medicine in general, our researchers sometimes have access to harmful substances. We don't want to risk threats to the public, so we keep our security tight. Or at least that's what I thought. After all, we're not some kind of rinky-dink lemonade stand for medical research, right? Yeah, it turns out that for two whole months, one of our researchers and his assistants had been working on a drug that nobody except themselves knew about. The rest of the facility only found out when this guy's entire branch had disappeared. There were five assistants that went away with him, so six rather essential staff members on the same team were missing. It was obvious something was wrong in that they had left as a group intentionally. It was left up to our own security personnel to find out where they had gone and why. We discovered several documents detailing their steps in developing a certain poison they only referred to as a magpie. We couldn't find anything on what it was made of, but we did get a vague idea of its intended effects just reading through those documents. I'm not big on whatever you have to know to create this kind of thing, but apparently they had been using our institute resources, among other things, to produce a poison that causes your body to fall apart. I've heard the word necrosis thrown around in the context, but I'm not sure on the specifics. All I know is that after oral ingestion of the magpie, your body more or less starts to decompose, but extremely rapidly and also while you're still alive. The relocation of our missing personnel as well as the destruction of the drug was what later would be called the magpie operation. Between us, Operation Magpie was a mistake. We should have gotten the police involved or the military even. Maybe I'm overestimating the importance of our situation here, but we do receive government funding, so perhaps that would have worked. Because as you know, we messed up. The researchers had hired people. I don't know who they were, but they were masked and armed. There were so many of them, way more than us. I don't want to talk about it too much because it makes me go crazy every time. Five of our people were forced to ingest the drug. Eva was one of them. I lost my leg when they threw in the grenade. All of the rogue researchers ended up dead, the drug was destroyed, and four of the poisoned security guards succumbed to Magpie. Four out of five. It took them way too long to bring the injured ones back. By the time that we had gotten all of the poisoned guards to our hospital wing, the symptoms of the drug had already started to set in. I still remember the way that Eva looked at me before they took her to one of the emergency rooms. Her eyes were glazed and she looked like she was about to fall asleep and clinging to consciousness. I can't even describe it. And then she slowly opened her mouth. Jonah, look, I think my arm's broken. It probably was since it had been hanging off at an odd angle the whole time. But then she moved over her healthy hand to the wrist of her broken arm grabbed it and pulled it ever so slightly, and it came off. Not right away, but there was a spot on her upper arm where the skin had turned a grayish color, and up there it kind of parted. I had never seen anything like it before. It just ripped. Even the flesh underneath had started to tear. I could see it split. There was blood coming out from underneath, more and more blood end. I need to stop writing now for my own sake. I said that I didn't want to go into detail, but now I did while at the same time trying to talk around the whole thing. I don't even make sense anymore. 
We need to meet up and talk properly. That'll be better anyways. I mean, you are a therapist. You know where my room is, just come by. The sooner, the better. Jonah. I sat the unfinished letter aside. I was feeling really strange, uneasy. Almost like I was going to throw up again, but I didn't taste any vomit in my mouth. I closed my eyes for a moment just to take the break and hugged my plush ducky a bit tighter. This was so weird. If the jack from the letter is my dad, he had been acting really gross to that evil lady. I don't know what that has to do with me or with the outcome of the magpie operation, but I hate imagining my father being a creep. Then again, Jonah hates dad, so maybe he made it all up. But I also hate to imagine Jonah being a liar. I decided to get on with my reading. I could still think about this later. Then I reached up and grabbed the second folder from Dr. Ellie's desk. Inside were a bunch of articles that she must have copied from books on psychology or something like that. There was one titled, The Controversy Around Repressed Memories, for example. I read a bit of that one, but I didn't really understand anything, so I stopped. The next folder was just pictures. Remembering my last experience with photos like that, I quickly grabbed Dr. Ellie's trash can and moved it to sit right beside me just in case. Only then I began studying the folder's contents. The first photo was of the face of a man that I hadn't seen before. He had tan skin and very short hair. He was looking into the camera really strangely, like he was very tired and had trouble staying awake. The second photo was of the same guy but with deep bags under his eyes and a dark red rash on his chin that stretched up to right below his bottom lip. In the next picture, that very same patch of skin was gone, like it had fallen off. The edges looked frayed and bloody and the area around it had turned gray. The man's teeth and gums were exposed, but even those looked sick and wrong. The gums were oddly pale and had peeled off the lower part of the man's teeth. In other places, they looked to be pilling like old clothes. I instinctively covered my mouth with my hand and turned away from the photo, but the image was fresh in my mind. I had to keep myself from freaking out again. I quickly took up the next one, hoping that it would be a bit easier to look at. It was. There was a woman on it, and she had dark blonde hair and looked just as tired as the man before her. When I picked up the photo after that one, my heart sank. I knew that one, and I had recognized it instantly, but having seen it before didn't make it any less terrifying. I was not going to throw up again, though. This was the very same photo that had been placed in my bedroom. There was even a little bit of vomit on it. And looking at the two pictures side by side, the one with the lady and the one that had scared me so much, I tried to look for similarities. It was very hard to make out, but if I squinted, I could kind of see it. For all I knew, this could even be Eva herself. Knowing what Jonah had said about Magpie, these were probably before and after pictures. Before and after the poison had started to work. Did this mean Dr. Ellie had been the one to plant that photo in my room? I didn't want to look at any more of them. My hands were shaking as I tucked them back into the folder, turned around so those tired eyes couldn't stare back at me. There was one last folder. I didn't open it, just looked at it from the side. There appeared to be just one sheet of paper and more photos. I was exhausted, too exhausted to keep going. I didn't want to read what was in there. It felt important somehow, but I simply didn't want to. Instead, I stayed right where I was, pulled my knees up to my chest and buried my face against the soft duck plushie. I felt like sleeping, but I knew if I would linger in this office I wasn't supposed to be in, I would probably get caught. I decided that I would take the contents of the last folder with me. Without looking, I took out the paper, folded it, and placed the photos inside. I stuffed it into my pocket. I took Jonah's letter too. I always wear these baggy hospital clothes that sort of look like medical scrubs. At least they apparently cover up suspicious paperwork, hidden on the body pretty well. I placed the folders on the desk the way that I had found them, 
put the trash can back where it belonged and stuffed the duck under my shirt. Sure, the plushie was a lot more obvious, but I wasn't going to leave it there. I checked the window to see if anybody was in the hallway. Fortunately, it was empty at the moment, so I quickly unlocked the door and slipped outside, only to lock it behind me. I went to hide the duck, the papers, and the key in my room before sitting down to contemplate what to do next. I really wanted to talk to somebody, to not be alone. I wanted to go and look for Jonah. As I stepped out into the hallway though, I bumped into someone. Not just someone. Dad. He had been standing right outside my door, his hand raised, just about to knock. Oops, he said looking down at me. There you are. Sorry I was gone all day, we should. I couldn't hear what he said next. The bright lights of the hallway were suddenly blinding me. I looked up at the ceiling lamps and they seemed to move and flicker. I couldn't see straight and my head was starting to spin. I turned back to my dad, a silent plea for help on my lips, but when I met his gaze, the weirdest thing had happened. I felt afraid. The fear surged through me like a wave. It was gone in a split second, but it was wrong. My knees suddenly gave in beneath me and I fell to the floor. I tried to get up, but I couldn't. Dad held out his hand to me, but then there was that fear again. I didn't want to take it. I batted it away and started crawling alongside the wall, digging my fingertips into it to try and lift myself off the ground, but it was useless. I heard my father shouting and footsteps approaching. I saw Cassandra, the nurse that I'm friends with, look down at me before reaching out to try to pull me off the floor. My body went limp in her arms when I fell unconscious. When I woke up, I was back in my room lying on the bed. Cassandra was there with me, breathing a relieved sigh upon noticing that I was awake. And she's back after just 55 seconds. She said softly, a gentle smile on her face. And do you know what happened out there? Do you? I uttered, my voice weak. I sent Jack away, she replied, not really answering my question. You seem to be afraid of him. I nodded against my pillow. Did he do something scary? Cassandra asked. Or say anything scary, perhaps. No, I answered quietly. He didn't do anything. I don't know why I was so scared just now. And that's the truth. Dad's always been nice to me. Even now as I type this sitting in the computer room, though, I feel a little off. Like something just isn't right anymore. I also have a lot of questions about this hospital now. Did all of this happen here? It would seem that way after what I read. I'll just see what tomorrow brings. This morning, I had breakfast with Dad. I sat across from him and I couldn't stop staring at him. We were both eating cereal, but mine tasted really bland. Maggie, sweetie, your hands are shaking, he suddenly remarked. Looking down, I saw the spoon that I was holding tremble spilling milk and dropping bits of cereal. I tightened my grip around it. That's weird, I muttered. Are you feeling all right? After what happened yesterday, I swear, I didn't want to scare you. If I did anything to upset you, I'm really sorry. Do you want anything? I could get you. I simply shook my head. I don't know what's wrong. I don't want any gifts. That's another thing with Dad. He always brings me presents even when I don't ask for anything. Dad seemed really disappointed that I wasn't talking to him as cheerfully as I normally did. I felt kind of guilty about that. Thankfully, the breakfast didn't go on for too long because, all of a sudden, a man showed up next to our table. He was older than Dad. His hair was gray already and he was wearing a lab coat over his blazer. He looked stressed, but had a friendly smile nonetheless. Nay hey there, you must be Maggie. Would you come with me for a moment? Dad glanced up at him in confusion. I figured that he knew the guy, but he didn't seem very happy to see him. What do you want with her? Since we fired Ellen at your request, we need to find a replacement therapist for Maggie. The older man replied, I think it's best if we talk to her about that directly. That would also give us the chance to discuss some other matters. 
Don't concern yourself with it, Jack. He handed me a plastic bag with something soft inside. You'll find some other clothes in there. Please put them on. What do I need other clothes for? Well, I'm going to take you to another station and it would be better if you'd be wearing something to fit in. Where are you taking her? Dad chimed in, sounding stern. East Station, the one that holds the briefing rooms and the security personnel break and locker rooms. He said this in such a casual manner, but Dad suddenly looked very uncomfortable. I went back to my room to change clothes. The older man had brought me a suit that looked kind of like a uniform. It was way too big for me. I would have almost been tall enough for it, but I didn't fill it in at all. I had to dig out an old belt of mine to keep my pants from falling down. I took the papers that I had borrowed from Ellie's office out from under my mattress, where I had been hiding them. I didn't want anybody to find them while I was gone, and by that I mean Dad. He's got the key to my room and nobody else. When I came back, I told the man in the lab coat that it was too wide for me. Of course it is, he said. You're skinny. You lost a ton of flesh during the reconstruction. What do you mean? I know from Ellie that you have recently discovered your hidden prosthetics. She gave me a whole bunch of reports on you. What you two had been talking about. How you were doing and all that. Wait, I always thought Dr. Ellie wasn't allowed to tell anybody what I told her. <laughs> Don't worry, she didn't tell me anything private. Only things that I have to know for what we're about to do. But first, mind if you follow me. I shook my head. I was still confused, but if Dr. Ellie had been talking to him, he was probably going to tell me more about uh, basically everything. Besides, I was happy to get away from Dad for a little while. I walked alongside the man back down the hallway. We passed by the mess hall and I took a quick look inside. Apparently, Dad had left, probably to go back to work. You can call me James. The man began, glancing down at me. You're probably wondering what I'm doing here. My job is to assign personnel of all categories. Research, security, and everything in between and make sure that they're all doing okay and going after their tasks as planned. Are you my dad's boss then? One of Jack's superiors, yes. There's more than just me. Now I want you to know that you can speak openly with me. If I understand correctly, Alan, or Ellie as you think to call her, has secretly left you some information that originally was meant to be kept from you. He gave me a searching look. I hardly understood a word he said, but I knew what this was about. I went into her office, I replied, if that's what you mean. Yes. Don't worry, you did nothing wrong and Dr. Ellie isn't in trouble either. Uh, she'll still stop working here though. We went through the station door and down a very long hallway. There was an elevator halfway in there and at the far end of the corridor there was a grey double door with large windows that had a B written on them. I had never been in another station than ours so when James opened the right door and waved me through, I was pretty excited. The B station was very different from the one that I had been staying in. It was smaller and didn't quite look like a hospital. I caught a few glances through some of the open doors that we walked by in passing. It was mostly office rooms with at least one table and a computer in it. But the further we got, the more the settings seemed to change. A large majority of the rooms in the B station were laboratories. What's everybody working on in here? I asked. They're experimenting. James answered curtly. Working on medicine and prosthetics. That's our thing here, isn't it? I echoed the line from Jonah's letter to Dr. Ellie. James didn't respond. I had never realized the sheer size of the building that we were in. I had thought that it didn't get any bigger than the hospital since that was already so huge. We went through a bunch of these corridors and saw so many more rooms like that one. I felt like we were in a whole other world if that makes sense. Then we went up a few flights of stairs and took the elevator up to another level. We're here, James said ushering me through a large door and along another hallway, 
until he finally stopped in front of another double door. This one was green and the sign next to it read, Briefing. The older man opened it and we slipped inside. The room had seemingly been prepared for our arrival. There were four people waiting inside. Dr. Ellie, Jonah, and the nurses, Ethan and Cassandra, were all seated in the chairs lining the room. It's strange since I know all of them, but when I came in, they were staring right at me. It was a bit creepy, to be frank. And Dr. Ellie had an odd look on her face, like an uncomfortable little smile. She wasn't wearing her employee badge and was dressed a lot more informally than usual. No heels this time. Cassandra and Ethan both had unease written all over their features, and Cassandra was shifting in her seat like she was trying to push down her nervousness. Jonah's expression was completely unreadable. I immediately walked over to Dr. Ellie. I was happy to see her, especially since I thought that yesterday was the last time that we would ever meet. You're here, I remarked, mostly because I didn't know what else to say. Glancing around between her and the others, I was starting to grow rather anxious myself. What is all this? The papers from my office. Dr. Ellie began. Did you read all of them? I shook my head no. Not the ones from the last folder, I replied. She sighed. Well, um, those are kind of important, but I thought so. Could it be that you read the others and just needed a break because it was difficult? I nodded. Do you know why it's so difficult? Well, because the pictures are so gruesome. That, that too. I wasn't sure how to present those to you in particular. I thought it was important that you saw, but just like those other documents, I figured maybe it would be best if you explored all of that on your own, at your own pace. I slowly reached into my pockets and pulled out the papers. I didn't read them, but I've got them with me. All right, well, Ellie sighed again more deeply. She looked a bit strained. I can just tell you, but that means I would like for you to entertain a certain thought. It's a very unpleasant one, but I just want you to listen to what I'll tell you about, okay? Okay. The feeling of uncomfort within me grew as James pulled up a chair for me to sit in. He situated himself beside me at a small distance, though. The incident you read about in my letter, the magpie operation, Jonah suddenly spoke up. Yesterday, it's been exactly one year since that happened. I believe that's why this whole thing resurfaced in everybody's minds. But that might be good, because we're going to try something now that might give you back a part of yourself that you've been missing. What we're doing here is risky. We've tried to lead you to it in our own way, you know, to prepare you for this. The picture in your room and my little stunt in the bathroom. You've suffered a total of two panic attacks in the last few days, but you overcame them, and that's why we hope that maybe this time it'll work. Are you talking about what you said at the start of your letter? I asked, like somebody would confront me with some truth, but that would make me slip away further. It was something like that, wasn't it? Jonah nodded. So we're going to try this again. We want you to know that you're safe with us, okay? Nothing's going to happen to you. I know you've only met James today, but you know us, and if you start feeling bad, Ellie and I are here for you. All right, I muttered, my voice trailing off. So, Ellie began. A year ago, five security guards were poisoned with the magpie drug. By the time they got here for treatment, it was already taking its toll on them. Of course, we have amazing doctors and surgeons and they were all doing their best. But despite having treated terrible injuries in the past, they haven't been confronted with anything quite like this before. Magpie was robbing these people of their flesh, making them waste away. Back then, it was kind of common knowledge that Jack was one of our best people here. And he decided to focus on one of the injured in particular. Just one. As you know, Eva was among them, so it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that he cared only for her. I don't understand how he did it, but somehow he managed to stabilize her and then proceeded to replace all of the body parts the poison had been attacking, which was a lot. 
Magpie was stripping her of her skin, but it also seemed to make the bones incredibly brittle. She was losing a lot of blood and, of course, it would not stop there. He was reconstructing this woman's body while it was falling apart. Bone implants, artificial skin, I never managed to stomach all the details. I heard that half of her lower jaw fell off together with the flesh of her face. One of her arms definitely did. Jack restored it though all of it, and months later she was complete. I wasn't there then, but that's what I've been told. I've never met Eva before Operation Magpie, but I did meet her after the reconstruction process. Dr. Edley paused. Magpie, Eva wasn't the same afterwards. Not only was she a couple inches shorter, the shape of her body had changed too. She had lost all of her hair, so what she had now was technically a wig, and her face was different too. I mean, there was still a lot of resemblance, but it was most certainly not the same. But the most drastic change was probably what was going on in her head. Eva had forgotten about Operation Magpie. In fact, she had forgotten about everything. Who she was, what she used to do, it was all gone. But in her distress, she developed a strong attachment to one person who had been around her ever since she had woken up. I stared at her with wide eyes. In the back of my mind, something had started to grow, kind of like I knew where she was going with this. I knew what she meant, but it couldn't be true. I decided to keep my mouth shut and listen. I was getting it wrong, probably. It had to be wrong. Jonah cleared his throat. I saw you when you first came out. You couldn't walk properly at first, but you were clinging to Jack's arm like a lifeline. And when you called him dad, he didn't correct you. He was the first one to encourage your, uh, your thing, your new identity. That's when the first efforts to restore your memory were made, and as you know, it had kind of the opposite effect. Eventually, we all went back to treating you like a child. Jack was the one to name you. Magpie, Maggie. Nodding over at James, he added, If you ask me, that alone should be proof of what a sicko he is. Either way, I knew this wasn't right. It was the most disgusting thing I had ever seen. He was holding your hand, hugging you. And that's just what he did when there were people around. You were completely oblivious. Worse yet, only I realized how messed up it was since I was the only one Eva had told about his obsession with her. At first, I was like, okay, he probably just plays along for her sake, but then I overheard two certain nurses. Jonah gestured towards Cassandra and Ethan, talking about how he had apparently saved some of the bones that he had dug out of your body during the reconstruction. So what I did was I told them about the harassment, the photos, and lipstick. We didn't want to file a complaint right away since it would directly involve you and you were still very unstable. So we kept our eyes out for any signs that he could have been. Jonah fell silent and he wiped his forehead, an almost despairing frown on his face. You seemed to be okay, but still we couldn't take it anymore so we tried to contact the director of personnel. That's James by the way. You see, Jack was allowed to supervise you and basically treat you the way that he's been doing, and we wanted him to be kept away from you. But apparently since Jack is so important, and our concerns were based on rumors only, we weren't taken very seriously. The only thing we achieved was that the therapist assigned to you would check for the same signs, ask you questions and everything. Jonah shot Ellie a sympathetic glance. There was practically no balance to be found. We couldn't risk you having another breakdown, but every day without your memory of being Eva means another day at his mercy. We knew that he was using the position that he was in, just not how exactly. And Daddy isn't like that. It was the only thing that I could say. That man is not your father. Dr. Ellie's voice was low and stern. You're lying. I felt tears well up in my eyes. 
You're all lying because you hate dad. I glared at Dr. Ellie and my vision starting to blur. Please calm down. She looked at me with a desperate plea in her eyes, cautiously taking a step towards me. Please, you promised you would hear us out. Just consider it, I'm begging you. I don't look like that evil woman at all. You think that I wouldn't have noticed. I saw her pictures, I'm not stupid. Ellie shook her head. Denial is a powerful thing. You partly couldn't and didn't want to remember, so you blocked out all the signs. They were there and deep down, you'd been suspecting something to be wrong for a while, but you kept pushing it all away. You ignored that you're lacking any memory of ever having been in any place other than the hospital. You've been here for one year, and not even awake for the first part of it. You don't remember yourself as a smaller child, and you know the timeline just doesn't add up, but you don't want to see it. So, you don't let yourself see it. That's not true, I muttered, shaking my head. There's more, Ethan spoke up. His voice was soft and gentle. He stood up and walked towards me until he was right in front of me. He motioned for me to stand up straight and I did, wordlessly. Notice how you're actually not that much shorter than me. Eva was tall so even after the reconstruction, you can still see eye to eye with most people. Sure, there's always exceptions, but kids, they're usually smaller. I was sobbing at that point. It made sense and I hated that it made sense. It wasn't supposed to. I'm so sorry, Cassandra uttered. Just leave me alone, I shouted. All of you. The nurse was about to argue when Dr. Ellie said, I think we should give her a minute to herself. She began ushering the four others outside. Looking over her shoulder, she told me that they would be back in a little while. I plopped down on my chair. I couldn't have stayed standing had I wanted to. The room was spinning. I leaned my head back and stared up at the ceiling. And that's when I saw something. Men in black masks. For a second, I thought that I had fallen asleep and was having one of my nightmares, but somehow this felt real. For the first time, I could actually comprehend what was happening. There was about three of them in total. I was lying on the floor, my arm was burning with pain. One of those guys had broken it, I knew it. Now, that same guy was standing over me, standing on my wrist, his boot holding it down. Hey, he called out over his shoulder. Here's one. Footsteps came up to them from behind and another masked man appeared at his side. He was holding something in his gloved hand, something small and white. The doc says to feed her this, open her mouth. One of the guys beside me bent down, placing his knee on my other arm to keep me from squirming. The second used his fingers and parted my lips. I bit him. He was too wearing gloves, but I clenched my teeth so hard that he let out a howl of pain and pulled back. Didn't I tell you to stay still? The one standing by my feet bellowed. His gun pointed at me. I didn't care. I knew what that drug would do to me and I would rather die being shot. I yanked my good arm free, swinging at the man kneeling beside me, but he grabbed it and pinned me down again. He placed his hand right under my chin and gripping my lower jaw. The one holding the pill bent down and grabbed the upper half of my face, holding it in place as the other one pulled my mouth open. I screamed at the top of my lungs but they didn't stop. My vision was obscured by the man's palm, but I felt him place the pill under my tongue and then slam my jaw shut. One hand covered my mouth, the other one moved to squeeze my nose shut. I didn't want to swallow, I couldn't breathe, but I would still rather suffocate than swallow. I didn't want to end like this, and then I realized the pill was slowly starting to dissolve in my mouth. The lack of air was starting to get painful and out of pure reflex I pushed it down my throat. My attackers finally let go of me and I gasped for air, and that's when I snapped out of it. I was still sitting in that same chair in the briefing room. Eva had been forced to ingest the drug. I had known all along, hadn't I? 
I stood up and went over to the door to knock against it from the inside. Apparently the others had been waiting right outside the room, seeing as they came back in at my signal. Dr. Ali looked at me, a question in her gaze, and I turned my head away and nodded. As it turns out, this whole thing has also been their attempt to convince James to do something about Jack. I've told them everything about how he acts towards me, but even so, nothing came of it. He's been moved to another station, but he still works here. James put it like this. Here we have one of the most brilliant minds in his field. He saved lives and he could save countless more. What do you do with someone like this if he does something others may think is morally wrong? I think what he means is that Jack is too important to give up on, and I can't leave either. I'm living proof of what he can do. I need to be supervised even if it's not by him. I need to be kept safe so they can show me to the world someday. I would like to tell you that I'm better off knowing the truth. And yes, I remember everything. I remember how my skin had started to flake off. How afraid I was when I saw the first strand of hair still connected to a torn, bloody patch of my scalp in my own hand. I remember how I lost my arm. I remember seeing the whole thing fall to the floor. God, the sound it made. Still, I don't feel like Eva. I know that I used to be her, but it's just not me. I don't even react to that name, but I also don't feel like I used to anymore. I'm neither a child nor an adult. I feel little, but my body's all grown up. How hadn't I noticed that? I don't even think that I can be called human anymore. I'm a robot, and that's what I am. I'm not going to see Jack again anytime soon. That's what James assured me. The sad thing is that I don't even know how to feel about that. Don't get me wrong, I hate him. I hate him so much it hurts to write his name. Still, writing this, I referred to him as dad all throughout the first part and I didn't even notice. Then again, there's a lot that I overlooked. So that's just one more detail. Dad. Dad who looks nothing like me. Dad who helped me change clothes even if I didn't ask for it. Dad, who I was so sure loved me more than anyone else in the world. I used to feel kind of safe, you know. I guess I was happy, confused, but happy. I have nothing now. James said that if I wanted to, I could always ask to assist in the labs to go back to work in security. I think the former sounds kind of interesting. I might learn stuff about myself. Still, that's in the future. As of now, Dr. Ellie's left me. Jonah, Cassandra, and Ethan are still here, but that's the only good thing. Jonah told me that if I wouldn't be able to sleep after all this, we could get crappy hospital candy and watch TV together. So I'm guessing that's what I'll be up to after I finish writing this. I'm actually kind of looking forward to it. Thank you guys for everything. You've been really kind and I appreciate it. Goodbye.